to steal a line from a slightly tedious game show that was on over the past couple weeks, the stakes cannot be overestimated. This woman is a widow, which means her husband has died, which means her economic position is precarious. She has a son, however, so there's some hope. The orphan, or not orphan, but the, the boy, will be able to work, will be able to provide for her family, her household. But then he dies. In a small town, everybody understands what's at stake, and they form their funeral procession. It's a sad occasion. Not only the loss of her son and the previous loss of, loss of her husband in the background, but presumably great fear and anxiety in a time and in a place where widows in particular, devoid of father, husband, or son, were thrown upon the largesse of the community for any hope for support. One can imagine others in the community knowing of their gen generalized obligation to care for widows, wondering who was going to take the first shift how is this going to work out for her? She probably not really wanting to be thrown onto the mercy of her town in quite that way. And into that situation, Jesus comes. And the first thing to notice about what he does is that he touches the beer, the coffin. The import of this is that doing that makes you ritually unclean. Now, this is often misunderstood. That doesn't mean it's a sin. That doesn't even mean it's a bad thing to do because caring for those who have died is an important thing to do. But it does mean that you've become dirty and you'll need to go become clean before you can really be part of the community again. You need to go wash your spiritual hands because you've crossed over into death. You've become tainted with death. What we need to hear here is that Jesus has, in a very literal way, crossed over a boundary between life and death. And rather than himself being tainted by death, the reverse has happened. Death has become tainted by its contact with the Lord of life. It is as if the world of first century Palestine has had the, the stage, the set, torn a little bit. And the difference between the stage and backstage and audience has gotten all mixed up for a moment. All of the organized structure of the world is breaking down around us. Because life cannot be contained. And so Jesus touches the beer, and a little bit of the Lord of life leaks backstage into death, into the part we don't really want to see, lest it taint us. What moves him to this act is not, interestingly enough, compassion for the dead child. It is compassion for the mother. 
This is one of those woman-centered stories. It's all about her. The whole thing is about her. He has compassion on her because he, like everyone else, knows the economic precariousness of the situation. He can see on her face fear, anxiety, and deep grief for, for just the loss of her son. How much her life has changed from the presumably happy wedding day, however many years before, with probably that same whole small town in attendance. So the stranger comes to down. Nobody quite knows who he is. This is not his place. This is at the very beginning of his, of his ministry. The stranger comes to town and walks up to the funeral procession without a word or a request for permission, touches the beer, and tells the child, now alive, to get up. And they are terrified. Because when the structures around you start to get ripped apart because life cannot be contained by the boxes we will put around it, the structure of our own lives gets thrown into doubt. At least they knew what to expect, more or less, about what it meant to have a childless widow in town. She knew more or less what her new social role was going to be, even if it was by no means what she wanted. But they very, very quickly move from fear to joy. Perhaps they don't even move. Perhaps it's all at once fear and joy. With that boundary ripped apart, they know two things, that a prophet is here, somebody who speaks and acts with the power of God. And they know that God has looked upon God's people, has seen them, has taken notice, not just of one woman, not just of one town, but of the whole people are now in God's eye. Finally, finally maybe there's a chance for the oppression that they suffer to be lifted. Now that God has seen and taken notice. And so the report spreads. And other people in other towns begin to hear that the boundaries are being ripped apart. The Apostle Paul knew this himself, or came to know it. He also was comforted and helped by boundaries, boundaries that established his role as part of the chosen race, boundaries that established his role as a guardian of orthodoxy, boundaries that established his own hope as a Pharisee that by faithful keeping of the law and commandments of God, God would restore God's favor to the people. And this brought him to the extremity of doing something which is contrary to that very law, which is rounding people up essentially for summary execution. And on his plan to go do that, he, a blinding light from heaven, scales on his eyes, he hears a voice. It's told three times in the Acts of the Apostles and alluded to in today's reading. 
And each time the details are a little different, and they're different because when the scene starts to fall apart and the scenery starts coming down and you don't know what's stage and what's audience and what's backstage and you can't tell the players from the audience from the director anymore, in that kind of situation, that much confusion, of course, of course, the words you use to try to describe such an event will never capture its full meaning. And so Paul ends up in Damascus, and here he emphasizes for the churches in Galatia that everything that followed came from God and not from all of the other apostles. He has a reason in this particular letter for underlining that point so strongly. But let's now just rest with that point. Paul lacks ecclesiastical sanction for his ministry. He has not been approved by the apostles. Rather, after he begins his ministry, the apostles take notice and rejoice in it. It's interesting that we, among other things today, celebrate the entry of our brother Robert into the diaconate yesterday morning. An official stamp of ecclesiastical approval on his ministry. I was there. I saw it. But if you know even one thing about the process of going from maybe God wants me to be a deacon to the bishop's hands pressing down on his head, it's that nobody would have let Robert get anywhere near this far in the process if he was waiting for that to happen before he started his ministry. It's quite the opposite. Robert has been doing ministry in the world and in this place and in ways that most of us probably know nothing about and only he sees, or ways in which he has been the presence of Christ to others and he doesn't even know it. That has been going on for years. Robert is in touch with the Spirit of God. God has a plan for Robert that did not begin yesterday, but began long ago. Well, it ain't just Robert. Everyone in this room is called by God to ministry, to service. Not to the diaconate. We need all different orders in the church. It would be a sad church indeed if it were only deacons. It would be a sad church indeed if it were only clergy. But it is not a church of clergy and customer. Because we are not the audience. This isn't the audience section and the stage section. Because those boundaries have been ripped apart. It's topsy-turvy time. There's several clergy sitting out there today, and there's a whole raft of lay people sitting up here today. Because the whole building belongs to all of us, because the church is the whole assembled people with all of its different character, each of us bringing our own strengths, each of us called in different ways to ministry, some of which we may never see the fruits of, and we may not even know we're doing it when we do it. That's what happens when the borders are ripped apart, and when life starts leaking into places that it had been carefully kept out of. This Sunday, like all Sundays, we celebrate the resurrection of Christ because that's the model for all of this. 
Jesus' resurrection is read back into the story at Nain, and it's read forward into the story on the Damascus Road, and it's read into our own lives. That is where heaven and earth are joined and where the boundary that separates us is ripped apart. It is where death not only was touched by life in a funeral procession, it's where death attempted to swallow up life. And like a fish bone stuck in the devil's throat, it went the other way. The life of Christ could not be contained by the darkest death in the darkest night, but burst the tomb open. So we celebrate today, Robert, but even more we celebrate today the, the Christ who has given each of us our vocation and our task to go into the dark places, to cross the boundaries, to touch the coffins, to bring life where others can only see death.